Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jessica Wilson, Executive Director of New York City Audubon. For those of you who are new to our organization, New York City Audubon works in all five boroughs to protect wild birds and their habitat through research science, advocacy, education, and outreach. Thank you all for joining us for this last session of our winter lecture series. I'd like to give a big thank you to Claude and Lucien Bloch, whose generous support of the series has made tonight's lecture possible and allowed us to bring you talks on a variety of topics. Tonight, we have two very exciting guests, authors Jonathan Myberg and Scott Widensall. Jonathan Myberg is the leader of the band Shearwater and has written reviews, features, and interviews for print and online publications on a wide array of subjects, including the last long-form interview with author Peter Mathiason. His latest book on the Kara Kara, titled A Most Remarkable Creature, was named one of NPR's best books of 2021. Jonathan is joined tonight by ornithologist and writer Scott Widensall, who has written nearly 30 books on natural history, including Living on the Wind, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Scott's most recent book, the New York Times bestseller, A World on the Wing, is an exploration of the science and wonder of global bird migration. We're so grateful that they could join us tonight. Throughout the conversation this evening, you may submit questions by using the Q&A function in Zoom, which depending on your computer is probably located at the bottom of your screen. We'll take questions at the end as time allows. I'm now happy to turn the conversation over to Jonathan and Scott. Thank you, Jessica. Um, hi, Scott. Hey, Jonathan, how are you doing? Doing all right. Um, we, uh, when we, we, we met a couple of weeks ago just to sort of talk about what on earth we were going to talk about. And the, the subject that we both kept coming back to was uh, birds' minds, because we tend to think of, there's been uh, a lot of conversation about the way that evolution has shaped birds' bodies um, and for flight and for uh, the various things that they need to do in order to live the lives that they live. Um, but this the field of uh, avian cognition has been sort of a more, more recent uh, or has exploded in recent years. And even though I think you and I are, 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 are not explicitly focused on that, um, our, our two books that we both published last year um, deal with uh, the ways that evolution has shaped the minds of birds in some really fascinating ways and are different. Um, so I was going to uh, start off by sort of handing off to you because the, in the, your studies of bird migration, um, you've learned quite a bit about this. So, and then uh, we'll, we'll switch back over to me in a little bit. Yeah, and I'm really anxious to see what kind of questions we get from people because I think people are finally starting to realize birds are not bird brains. Um, you know, there have been there have been some really great books. Jennifer Ackerman's done a couple of books on on the genius of birds and bird cognition. Um, and it seems like almost every week there's a new study that shows, like for example, um, Australian magpies, you know, cleverly yes. removing the tracking devices that people had put on them. Uh, that, that birds are just way way smarter and and alive to you know realms of the senses that are kind that we're kind of blind deaf and dumb to much more so than people have have ever given them credit for you know we, we've always had this idea that birds are like little stimulus response automatons and they're not by any stretch of the imagination so i've got some i've got some slides and i'm going to do the um screen share two-step here just for a moment while we switch that over and i was going to, to mention that uh uh, you know, the last time that humans and birds had a common ancestor was about 300 million years ago. So if you figure we've been on separate journeys since that time, there's almost half a billion years of evolutionary time between us. Um, and yet we've sort of arrived at some, some intriguingly similar places in some ways and very different ones. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Well, I mean, we're both very visual organisms, uh, birds and birds and humans. And so that's that's driven a lot of that evolution. But you know, birds exist in these other realms and um, have had to develop other other senses and other ways of understanding and processing the information that the world gives them. So, um, you know, my, my focus has primarily been on on migratory birds and, and bird migration. And you know, we we kind of have run out of superlatives to describe 
the feats that migratory birds, especially like long distance migrants, like many of the migratory shorebirds um, accomplish every year when they're traveling. Um, you know, some of these, a lot of these are, are physiological feats, um, you know, little semi palmated sandpipers that weigh a little bit more than an ounce, they may be six inches long that take off this particular population from the central Canadian Arctic. It takes off from the northeastern coast of North America and flies 3,300 miles nonstop across the Western Atlantic to the northeastern coast of South America, which is the equivalent of 126 consecutive marathons over the course of four or five days with no food or water or rest. Um, and yet for migratory birds, that's really almost run of the mill. Um, but you know, there are feats of cognition and, and sensory interpretation that, that birds are able to accomplish that seem equally unbelievable. And in fact, some of this is like literally unbelievable, at least in the eyes of some people. Um, in 2015, there was a, a paper that was published saying that um, golden-winged warblers, population of golden-winged warblers that were being studied in the mountains of, of Tennessee suddenly picked up and moved from their breeding grounds um, to the west coast of Florida and western Cuba and did that in a couple of days and then came back a couple of days later and in the process avoided this huge storm system that produced something like 84 tornadoes and killed dozens and dozens of people. And the scientists that reported this were speculating that the birds detected probably infrasound, extremely low frequency sound waves that were generated hundreds of miles ahead of the storm. It gave them um, warning that the storms were coming and they got out of Dodge and then they came back again. Now, I say this was to some people literally unbelievable. A, a, lot, of, a lot of people were very deeply skeptical of, of whether this was possible or not. But I had a conversation not long ago with a, a Penn State meteorologist who's also an avid birder and who specializes in studying large scale atmospheric waves. And he told me he finds this perfectly plausible um, and suggested that maybe rather than using infrasound, the birds were, were sensing internal gravity waves that are generated. Um, these are basically waves that are generated in the atmosphere that propagate out hundreds of miles in front of major storm systems. Now we don't know that birds can detect these internal gravity waves. That's an open question, but it struck him and it certainly strikes me as, as something worth investigating because I think every time we, we take a look under the hood with birds, we find that they're, they're attuned to things that we're not even aware of. We're really, you know, we're just scratching the surface of how birds orient and navigate across immense distances. And, and there's no more immense barrier anywhere on, the, on this planet um, to long distance migrants in the Pacific Ocean. And yet there's a, a number of land birds. I mean, we don't think of shorebirds like this bristle-fied curlew or bar-tailed godwit or Pacific golden plover as land birds, but they're sure not seabirds. I mean, these birds migrate across the widest part of the Pacific Ocean. And if at any point in that migration, they land on the surface of the ocean, they're dead. Um, and the distances they go are extraordinary, but the ways they get there are even more remarkable. This is a, a wind map um, of prevailing winds across the Pacific Ocean. That's Alaska up at the top. You can see Australia and New Zealand down toward the bottom. And bar-tailed godwits that take off from Alaska in, in September fly about 8,100 miles nonstop. That's a journey of anywhere from seven to 11 days of constant laborious, you know, powered flight across the Pacific Ocean. But notice how they're using prevailing winds, prevailing winds coming down out of the, the, out of the Aleutians, um, the Northeast and Southeasterly trade winds across the middle of the Pacific. Um, they land in New Zealand, they spend the austral summer down there, and then they turn around and head the opposite direction um, in March and April. They're using, again, those prevailing um, trade winds to get them up to the Yellow Sea between China and the Korean Peninsula, and then they use the westerlies from there all the way back up to Alaska. So it's about 18,000 miles a year, and it's possible only because these birds are able to sense the position and movement and predict where these winds are going to be most favorable. In fact, there's been a number of times when scientists have documented birds like these godwits taking off into um, headwinds. You know, the, the, the last thing you'd think they'd want to do, headwinds close to land, but there are, there are strong tailwinds farther out to sea. How they know that those tailwinds are out there, we really don't know. And I, I think we don't, we fail to understand when you look at a map like this, I mean, it's a little, it's a little blue circle on your screen. We don't understand how, 
truly enormous the Pacific is. There was a, a wonderful new paper that was published last month by Dr. Tunis Piersma, um, a friend of mine from the, the Netherlands, who's like Dr. Shorebird, and a number of his colleagues. Um, and they included this graphic. You can take the entire landmass of the planet and fit it into the Pacific Ocean and still have room left over. It's about 10% of ocean leftovers. That really gives you a sense of how enormous the journeys of these birds are. And incidentally, if um, this article in, in the journal Ornithology that they, that they wrote is just a little bit dense, but it's one of the most thought-provoking papers about bird migration I've read in years. It's worth perusing if you're at all interested in the subject. And, and when I'm done here, I'll put a link to an open access PDF of that in the chat if anybody's interested. But you know, whether birds are making a, a trans-Pacific crossing or making a, a less dramatic migration, birds use this a host of, of orientation and navigational clues, including some that we've only, really only recently documented and others that still remain essentially unknown to us. Um, one of the most important navigational cues and orientation cues that migratory birds use, most of them migrate after dark, um, and that's celestial orientation. They're, they're not using the pattern of the stars in the night sky. They're using the apparent rotation of the stars around Polaris, which provides that anchor point um, around which the rest of the sky seems to rotate. But you know, seabirds like the sooty shearwater, they can navigate across thousands of miles of ocean by smell, um, uh, you know, apparently smelling their way back home. And one of the most important cues for them appears to be concentrations of dimethyl sulfide, which is a stinky chemical that's produced by phytoplankton and which varies regionally by ocean currents and ocean temperatures. Um, it's it basically, it's an olfactory map of the sea. And it's not just seabirds that use this. In some parts of the world, um, homing pigeons, like for example, homing pigeons in Italy navigate primarily using an olfactory map. If you sever the nerve um, that connects their, their nasal region with their, with their brain, they lose the ability to, to navigate. One really interesting um, aspect of navigation in those trans-Pacific migrant shorebirds, like I mentioned, um, something that, that um, uh, Tunis Piersman and his colleagues speculate about in that paper I just mentioned, is the degree to which these birds may be using large-scale um, ocean wave and swell patterns. And if that rings a bell with you, that's one of the same ways that Polynesian seafarers were able to navigate across thousands of miles of the Pacific Ocean in their, in their double-hulled outrigger canoes. Waves um, that are created by wind and ocean currents um, interact with continents, they interact with um, island chains, and they produce predictable patterns of waves that spread out for hundreds of miles and which are easily visible by birds that are flying thousands of miles overhead. And scientists may finally have cracked one of the biggest remaining mysteries of, of bird navigation, how they're able to tap into the Earth's extremely weak magnetic field. We've known since the 1860s that birds have a magnetic sense. And we've known since the middle of the 20th century that somehow it was connected to vision, but we didn't know how until fairly recently. And it turns out it's, it's based in a form of quantum physics that was so weird that even though it grew out of his own equations, Albert Einstein basically disowned it. It's called quantum entanglement or radical pair theory. And and I should preface this by saying I am not a quantum physicist, nor do I play one on television. But if you're a summer tanager like this one, you're migrating north through the night sky across the Gulf of Mexico, a photon of light enters the bird's eye and it strikes a, 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 a pigment protein called cryptochrome. And it knocks an electron off that cryptochrome protein into an adjacent cryptochrome protein. And these two cryptochromes become quantumly entangled. They become essentially in quantum theory, a single unified thing. If you move those two cryptochromes anywhere in the universe, what affected one would instantaneously affect the other. But it also makes them magnetically sensitive just for a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. So you have a magnetically sensitive pigment molecule in the bird's eye. And it appears that as the, as the summer tanager is flying north through the night sky, through the Earth's magnetic field, waves of pigment in its eye are allowing it to visualize the, the dip and strike angle of the, of the magnetic field as it enters the Earth's surface and gives it, a, um, gives it a magnetic sense, which is fascinating and weird, but only partially explains how birds are able to orient magnetically. We know now from, from tracking individual birds um, across thousands of miles that they can adjust their route 
to, to travel along the very shortest route from point A to point B in a way that is identical to somebody using a GPS system connected to the GPS satellites overhead, except they don't have GPS and GPS satellites. They're using some cue, some sensitivity that we don't know about. Um, based, on, based on what the birds are able to do, they shouldn't be able to do this, but they do. So there remains at least one more significant navigational sense, a map sense that birds are using and that we have yet to decipher, which is a very cool thing because a natural world without mystery would be a very dull place. But all of this shows, I think, that, as I said before, birds are alive to realms of the senses that we just cannot comprehend. And they have cognitive abilities to synthesize, synthesize all of this information that those senses provide that we can just barely comprehend. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and kind of hand things back over to Jonathan, who um, has, I mean, I have to say, if you have not read Jonathan's book, A Most Remarkable Creature, about caracaras, you should, A, because it's a marvelously written book, and B, because caracaras are some of the most fascinating birds on the planet um, because of the mental gymnastics that they can do. Well, I guess, God, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> that they are a fabulously weird uh, birds that it, it, it was funny as I'm, I'm was, was thinking uh, as you were talking that all of these mental mechanisms you know they're not they're not all present in all birds some birds have them some birds don't um and the the avian brain um seems unbelievably plastic i mean just the variety of different kinds of minds that exist within the ten thousand or so species of birds that there are Right, and seasonally plastic because in, in many species of birds, it grows at certain times of the year and shrinks at other times of the year. Um, you know, a chickadee prior to winter, its brain gets dramatically larger in the areas that provide um, the ability to remember locations because they're gonna be stashing thousands and thousands of sunflower seeds taken from your feeder and they need to be able to figure out how to go back and find them. The brains of migratory birds actually get smaller during migration probably because you know brain cells are energetically expensive and they need to put their energy into other things. I know something about this from touring with rock bands. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell the tour manager that they can predict what's going to happen 24 hours in advance. They're going to be regarded like a god by the musicians because they have no idea where they are or what's going on. <laughs> the, let's see here. You see that this uh, this here is a, a very famous migratory bird. This is a peregrine falcon, um, but uh, the caracaras, which got mentioned, which my, my book is about, are uh, are also falcons, but they're not the falcons that we usually think about in the northern world. Um, up here, usually we think about when you say falcon, we think about a peregrine or a kestrel or a merlin. Uh, these really expert bird hunters uh, that are extremely uh, focused on killing mostly other birds, although sometimes small mammals and things also or even insects um, but they're uh, you wouldn't say that they have a lot of personality exactly except that it's expressed in this um, this very very extreme uh, lifestyle but the falcon family uh, includes a lot of birds that aren't really like this at all and most of those uh, live in south america they include some birds you may not have heard of like uh, this one this is a laughing falcon it's a snake eating specialist cute little thing uh, really strange uh, and uh, non-migratory uh, or this uh, forest falcon. There are forest falcons are a group of tropical, um, uh, the tropical falcons that live in South America um, that are so poorly known that this one, which is called a cryptic forest falcon, was, I think, described as science in 2015. Uh, and, uh, but we really don't know very much about these birds at all. Uh, they're presumed to be kind of like sharp-shinned hawks or something, kind of like the accipiter hawks of, of the tropics. But they, there are also some indications that they run along tree trunks and um, spend a lot of time with some interesting associations with ant swarms, kind of like ant birds. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done about these birds, but not by me. This, uh, however, is a caracara. And this, for my money, is the weirdest bird of prey in the world. This is a red-throated caracara. And uh, this bird uses its brain for a very different thing than peregrine falcons do. Now, uh, these birds eat wasps' nests. Uh, they live in family groups of sometimes as many as 15 individuals, multiple males, multiple females. They spend a lot of time uh, roaming around the forest, patrolling these large territories and performing these kind of displays, these kind of martial uh, 
um, displays of wing waggling and screaming, and they have a really strangely wide vocal vocabulary. Um, and they uh, build nests in giant bromeliads, hundreds of feet up in trees. Let's see, here's a picture from the inside of one of those nests. Um, here's a young red-throated caracara getting its first look at a human being. And you can see there's bits of wasp comb there that its parents have brought to it. And also, intriguingly, a millipede. Uh, Sean McCann, who studied these birds in French Guiana, uh, found that uh, he put a nest camera on this nest. And the adults brought it mostly bits of wasp comb loaded with larvae, but they also brought a lot of millipedes to the nest. And he wasn't able to investigate exactly why, but his hunch is that um, millipedes secrete these sort of nasty chemicals, which if you've ever had one in your hand or something like that, they can leave sort of a, a burn or a stain on it. Um, they have these wonderful things called repugnatory glands, which if you disturb the millipede, it'll secrete this noxious goo. And it's part of what's helped them endure for uh, hundreds of millions of years. Uh, so they just taste really bad. The adult birds would bring these millipedes into the nest, hold them up to the chick, then bite the heads of the millipedes and drop them into the bottom of the nest and the chick wouldn't eat them. And Sean's uh, sort of working hypothesis is that as has been seen with some kinds of monkeys and in fact lemurs in Madagascar also, uh, which and will, will bother millipedes and then rub them all over their bodies, they may have some kind of um, uh, pest control type function, like they may deter skin parasites, because there are a lot of things in the tropics that want to live in you and eat you. And uh, if that is in fact what they're doing, but they sort of keep their nest cleaner of parasites by depositing millipedes in them, um, they're using a kind of chemical technology, which is pretty extraordinary. But that's uh, uh, one, uh, sort of one specialized thing that caracaras do. This is a, a yellow-headed caracara doing something that's a bit more typical of caracaras, which is finding food in all kinds of unlikely places here inside the ear of a snoozing tapir who seems quite happy to be groomed by this thing. Tapirs will even actually roll over on their backs and offer their bellies to be groomed uh, by yellow-headed and, and black caracaras. They'll eat their ticks and bot flies and all kinds of other nasty, juicy things that live in them. And this here is a crested caracara, which if uh, you live in New York, this is the only caracara you are likely to ever see at home. Uh, the first one ever seen in New York State was seen in 2015 at Bear Mountain State Park within sight of Manhattan. Um, when you look at this birdie, that doesn't almost nothing about it says falcon to you, <laughs> except for the fact that it is. And crested caracaras, which occur from you know mostly the southern United States all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, are just masters of eating whatever is around. One description of their uh, diet was any animal matter, and I think actually some vegetable matter as well, living or dead that it can catch or find. And they're also unlike the the true falcons, which tend to be quite solitary. Um, they kind of like company. Um, they like being around other caracaras, and they like being around other scavengers and opportunists. This one in South Texas here is hanging out with a turkey vulture, and then another one here is actually being groomed by a black vulture. They'll hang out with uh, turkey vultures and black vultures uh, in large groups, and you'll see them sometimes at uh, roadkill in South Texas or uh, places like this. They, they like to follow these birds around. They'll roost with them sometimes. They like company. And that's not at all unusual for caracaras. This is the one that really stole my heart um, and really got me into caracaras in the first place. This is a striated caracara, which is the rarest of the group. And they live down in the Falklands and Tierra del Fuego. And this picture here really captures what it's like to meet them. Um, they're not just innovative in terms of what eating anything that's available to them. Um, they uh, are very curious and very forthright. They want to know about anything that they haven't seen before, which if you visit them includes you. This is the first, uh, the, this is the cover of my book, but the, the illustration is uh, from 1775. This, as far as I know, is the first illustration by a European of Australia Caracara made by George Forster on James uh, Cook's ship, the Resolution, uh, near Tierra del Fuego. And what I love about this image is that, that you can tell that he saw this bird and that the bird saw him. This is just how they are. Their eyes kind of look into you in this really peculiar way. And another person that struck was Darwin. Uh, this is the only contemporary illustration of, of Darwin aboard the Beagle. Darwin's here in the middle. Uh, this is a cartoon kind of drawn for the, for the entertainment of the crew. And you can see all, all these guys are bringing things to Darwin. Uh, this guy's bringing him a, a bunch of seashells and a hat, and he's saying, the least I can get for these is a tot, because Darwin was paying them you know, to bring him stuff. 
And this guy over here is saying, I've killed a fine specimen of a flying monkey, shot three specimens of geese, and was very near being yaffled by a damn big bear. And sure enough, there in his hand, he's got a flying monkey. Well, the funny thing is that in the Falklands, which Darwin went to just after this picture was made, uh, which just to remind you where they are, here's South America, the Falklands are way down here, you know, not really all that far from the Antarctic Peninsula, about 750 miles. Um, they're about the size of Connecticut. And up here in the corner uh, is a place called the Jason Islands that figures in the book. There's the two big ones, Steeple Jason and Grand Jason. And this is what they look like. Now, Darwin didn't actually go to the Jasons, but he did go to the Falklands and he met a lot of striated caracaras there. And he was so interested by them and their weird behavior that he actually devoted more ink to them in the Voyage of the Beagle than he did to any other bird. And uh, he said they were tame and curious, quarrelsome and passionate. They stole hats and compasses and all kinds of things from the crew of the Beagle. Um, the, the Beagle's companionship, the adventure had to post a watch to keep the birds from flying on board and tearing the leather out of the rigging. Uh, they just couldn't, he had never run into a, a bird like this. Now, part of the reason that they were like this, I think, is that they were trying to make sense of something they'd very rarely seen before, which was human beings. The Falklands are one of the only places in the entire New World that Europeans can sort of plausibly claim to have discovered, at least in part. And so when you meet them there, as you still can today, um, they, you get the feeling of an animal that's still giving human beings the benefit of the doubt, which is something that's kind of passed many thousands of years into the past in most other parts of the world. Uh, this is an adult striated caracara here with the yellow legs and the chestnut trousers and the, you know, the clear silver bill, but the youngsters tend to be are, are sort of darker, more coffee colored. Striated caracaras face an interesting problem. And look back here, their, their main food source on islands like this are these seabirds, like these penguins here. Penguins, albatrosses, burrowing petrels. Now, these islands are just absolutely crammed full of them in the summertime. But in the wintertime, the seabirds go to sea. They can drink salt water. They can, they can sleep on the sea. They can sleep on the wing. They don't need land for anything. But the caracaras cannot follow them. And the, here's an adult striated caracara in the Falklands looking forlorn, standing on the nest of uh, black-browed albatross there. This nests are about the size of a spare tire. And the albatrosses build them out of mud. But this is the wintertime. And so this colony, which would be just full of tens of thousands of albatrosses in the summer, is absolutely vacant. These caracaras cannot follow them. And yet on that one island, there are more than 80 pairs of adult striated caracaras and an equivalent number of non-breeding birds. And they're there all year round. So they have to do something else. Now, part of what they do is this. They dig in the ground and they, they pull up invertebrates, beetles and grubs and um, uh, earthworms in particular. But uh, they also have to just watch the shore for anything that they have not seen before coming in, any, uh, uh, the carcass of a dead seal or a whale or something like that. This group uh, of young birds was, um, but I took this picture with my phone. This is how close you can get to them. Uh, but they were chewing on the really manky remains of a, of a sea lion that had died many weeks before, and they were just stuffing themselves with it. The, the bird in the middle there, that's its crop bulging out. There's nothing wrong with this bird. They just cram themselves full of anything that they can find that's edible. Where humans are concerned, this has caused some problems because uh, they're just absolutely, as Darwin found them, and as you still find them now, uh, absolutely unafraid of us. They come right up to you. They want to know what you're about. They try to take things out of your bag. Um, people talk about them stealing their cameras and this kind of thing. And uh, this is a very typical scene on an island called New Island in the Falklands where uh, if you're, you know, waking up and cooking breakfast, there'll be a striated caracara looking in at you, wondering about what it is that you're doing. This is a, a island called Carcass Island. Uh, this is a, a Falkland Islander named Lorraine McGill with a group of striated caracaras who know that she's going to toss them some kitchen scraps and they collect outside her door every morning. This is uh, me uh, taking a dinner order from a group of striated caracaras on New Island. And the, the thing is that beyond the sort of obvious sociality of these birds. They like being together. They want to know what each other are doing. They want to see what other birds are eating and how they're doing it. Uh, they, uh, in captivity, they've done some really extraordinary things. This is a, a young bird named Myrtle, um, who's now about two years old and uh, enjoys hanging out with a group of dogs who she runs around with. And if a dog finds something it likes and rolls around in it on the ground, she'll roll around in it on the ground. Here she is with an owl friend. At an early age, when these birds were reintroduced to each other a couple of years later, they seemed to recognize one another. This is really weird for a bird of prey. Uh, 
And this here is a bird named Tina uh, with a falconer named Jeff Pearson in Southern England. And Tina could do the most extraordinary things in flying demonstrations. Um, Jeff could uh, get her to identify blocks uh, by color, by shape. Um, he could throw a group of stuffed animals over his shoulder and uh, tell her to go get Nemo. She would jump down, run across the ground because caracaras, unlike the true falcons, are uh, uh, are really good at running, at walking and running on the ground. Um, she would pick up Nemo in her bill, come back, drop it in a bucket for a food reward. Or Jeff could even say, wait, I've changed my mind, get Miss Piggy instead. And she would put Nemo down and pick up Miss Piggy and come back with Miss Piggy. This is uh, Tina's successor, Evita, playing with one of her favorite toys. Now, this is a, not a caracara, this is a parrot, uh, but I put it here because it, uh, we've learned relatively recently that the nearest relative to falcons are not other birds of prey like hawks and eagles, they're in fact parrots. And you can sort of see something more like a, a parrot-like, or what we think of as a parrot-like mind, the sociality, the problem solving, the cleverness this, uh, in caracaras. And I wonder um, if it may be that the true falcons that we know better up here in the Northern world have basically kind of lost this, something that their ancestors um, had um, and in South America have retained. This is William Henry Hudson, who's one of the heroes of my book. He um, was well ahead of his time in um, granting, granting birds a, a degree of intelligence that uh, people uh, in, he, he was, sorry, I should place him in time. Uh, he was born in the 1840s uh, in Argentina and then moved to England when he was about 30 years old and uh, became one of the founders of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. But he said that all that is in our minds is also in theirs. And he loved caracaras because he grew up with them uh, south of Buenos Aires in the Pampas. He called crested caracaras living there lords of the feathered race, said they pry into and understand everything. And these birds, these humble looking little crow-sized caracaras called chimango caracaras were his favorites of all. He said, um, a bird so cosmopolitan in its habits would have a whole volume to itself in England. Being only a poor foreigner, it has had no more than a few unfriendly paragraphs bestowed upon it. And that's still largely true. Um, so little scientific work has been done on the behavior of these birds, but what has been done has been incredible. Um, well, there's an Argentine researcher named Laura Biondi who, with her colleagues, took a group of Chimango caracaras out of the wild, separated them into three groups, gave one group a set of plexiglass boxes to open that had a food reward inside. They had to figure out how to lift the lid to do it. The second group was set to watch the first group while they did this. The third group was set aside as a control. The first group did pretty well with the boxes, but when the second group was allowed to open the boxes, they did better a lot better than the first group. And it seemed that basically they had absorbed, uh, they had, it, it was social learning. They had learned how to watch, or they had learned how to exploit this resource by watching another group of birds exploit this resource. And this is really an incredible thing to be able to do. Um, if you play the violin in front of me, I can't play the violin, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, it's a really, really complicated and difficult thing to do. And they can do it really, really fast. And this ability to learn and learn from other caracaras uh, seems to be uh, really pronounced in this group. I should note um, before I, I stop here that uh, unlike uh, a lot of Europeans who have thought of caracaras as kind of like kind of dodgy birds of prey, even Darwin called them um, uh, false eagles who ill become so high a rank. Um, Amerindian cultures have uh, often found a lot to celebrate in them. This is a group of people in Riobamba, Ecuador, uh, in a uh, solstice inti rhyme parade, the, the, the Inca celebration of the solstice, uh, who are dressed as characters called curiquingues, which are sort of bringers of, of good fortune and good luck to the community for the rest of the year. And curiquingues are these birds. Uh, these are carunculated caracaras, which are an Andean species of caracara. And further south, let's see, in Peru, uh, in places that look like this, um, you find these birds, mountain caracaras. Um, this one is standing on the ruins of Machu Picchu. And uh, the Inca actually uh, were so thought so highly of this bird that only Inca emperors were allowed to wear their feathers in the mascapecha, the, the uh, sort of crowns or ceremonial headpiece uh, that they wore. Uh, mountain caracaras have interestingly been observed lifting heavy rocks in teams uh, to try to, to get... Uh, 
lizards or, or small mammals to come out from underneath them. Uh, and no other bird does that I know of has ever been seen doing anything like this. Here is a mountain caracara in Bolivia uh, two years ago during the pandemic um, that started visiting a high rise in La Paz. And the people at this one flat started feeding it um, corn and fruit and meat and other things that it seemed to like. And it liked it so well that uh, it brought back two friends that they built a nest and the three of them started breeding there on the on the ledge of the apartment. And in all the characters you see this, um, they're very good at finding partners in their search for food. And it makes them really good sort of, uh, it makes me optimistic about their future in many ways. Um, the striated caracaras have a, have a steeper hill to climb because there's so few of them. There are about as many as there are giant pandas, uh, and they're in a very vulnerable part of the world. But this kind of mind, this flexible, opportunistic, um, open to um, whatever the world might have to offer them, uh, is something that it's very easy for us to identify with, and it's quite different from other members of their family. So I'm going to stop there for now so we can take some questions. I think having watched that, Jonathan, we should all just be prepared to welcome our incoming Kara Kara overlords. <laughs> I'm pretty bullish about them. I think they, I think they might do okay. At least some of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah the first, the, the first time I saw Strata Kara Karas down in the Falklands, um, it was it was the first time that I really had a sense of a bird sizing me up and saying, "Yeah, we could take them. We could take them." He's not yeah, a two penguin, yeah. but a little harder to take down, but we can take them. Um, you there's know, just, something that so falconers in England kept saying this to me. They would say, "There's something in the eyes. There's something in the eyes," and there really is with that species. Yeah, there definitely, there definitely is. I was, I was on my belly on Carcass Island, actually. Um, Where Lorraine was with her group. Yes, that yes, the house. on my on my belly, photographing a, a group of them around a, a penguin carcass, and they just kind of all got up from the penguin carcass and gathered around me, and I'm kind of looking around at eye level with these birds. And you're right, there's. There's this, there's this kind of, I won't say wicked intelligence, but you know, wicked in the New England sense of that's a wicked smart bird, um, that <laughs> yes. makes you makes you start to think oh, maybe I should maybe I should be standing up right now, um, and you know, and and please may I have my hat back. You know, we just published a, a note about this actually, and from an observation on New Island, which I can't remember if we talked about this or not, where we saw. Um, we had set a, a trap that we're doing some banding um, on New Island and we'd, we'd set a trap. We were trying to catch one of a pair of two adult birds that was near the settlement and really kind of controlled this area as its territory. And another adult bird came in, was chased off by them. Then it came back and then it started trying to, it seemed like it was trying to act like a little fledgling. It started doing this wing fluttering thing, even though by plumage, it was a, more than a five-year-old bird and making a little tiny fledgling type sound I'm as if I'm a little baby I'm a little baby and the adults let it get a little bit closer I mean it may have been this is just like a really submissive display like I'm not here for your territory I just want food um, this didn't work though in the end and it jumped up onto a wall and it just straightened up and it, like it was like it took on a different personality and it suddenly started yelling <laughs> which is striated care care for hey you guys there's food here and suddenly there were about 12 more birds that came in and they all swarmed the trap and the adults that were trying to defend it just like couldn't handle this. And so everybody just started. And so you watch this bird go through three different strategies all in the course of about five minutes, including what seemed like a kind of deception to try to get what it wanted. Yeah, it does. You know, Bernd Heinrich has been working with ravens, common ravens for years, and he figures that they can reason at about the, the same level as a four or five year old human child. I will not be surprised when somebody does that kind of work with with Kara Karas and finds out that they're, you know, they're at the postgraduate level. <laughs> I hope so. I think this is a this is a, a, a rich vein. I, I'd love to see more people pursue it. Scott and Jonathan, thank you. This has been a fascinating look at, at migration, at avian mines, at millipede goo. We even got a little quantum physics in there. Um, we have about 10 minutes now to take some questions from the audience. Um, and so I'm gonna kick us off with some questions that have been put into the Q&A and I'll invite participants to continue to put those questions into the Q&A as we're talking. Uh, the first question is for Scott. Um, going back to the quantum physics, uh, 
Do you know how it was figured out that tanagers use quantum the quantum effects? And are there other birds that that share this trait? Well, it's not just it's not just tanagers. The assumption is that most migratory birds can do this. Um, and it, interestingly, the the person who came up with that first proposed that hypothesis was a, a German scientist named Klaus Schulten, who published something in a relatively obscure German um, physics. Uh, he was a physicist. A physics journal in the 1970s after it had been rejected by a more major journal. Um, he, he couldn't identify the, um, the chemical in the bird's eye that would allow it to, um, uh, you know, it, 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 what you needed was a, was a, um, a magnetically sensitive photo, photosensitive pigment molecule. He couldn't identify that, but he, he proposed this radical pair theory that would explain how this um, um, how this uh, would allow the birds to, to detect the, the Earth's magnetic field. Um, Dr. Schulten died a few years ago, but he lived long enough to see his, what was at one point considered a crackpot theory, um, shown, to be, shown to be correct. There's, there's a, a great deal of experimental evidence now to um, backing, backing that up. Um, and I have to be careful because like I said, I am not a quantum physicist, although I explained this once to a group of people um, that turned out included a quantum physicist who said, yeah, you got that explanation pretty right. So I've tried to, I tried to remain like kind of word, to, word for word with my, my description ever since then. But it's, but it's crazy, crazy stuff. But then there's this other, this other whole aspect of magnetic orientation, this map sense that we don't really understand. There's a, a trigeminal nerve that runs through the upper mandible of a, of a bird. Um, and if you sever the trigeminal nerve in a bird, it loses its ability to, to navigate, there's, that's somehow connected to this, map, this mysterious map set. So there's still a lot for us yet to learn. It's fascinating. Um, a question for, for Jonathan, actually for both of you. Um, Jonathan, you talked about the very pronounced opportunistic behavior of caracaras. Um, uh, are there other birds of prey that share that? Oh, yes. I mean, they're not the only ones like this. I mean, the uh, vultures, the old world vultures, the new world vultures, and, and kites also, which I, I would put, if, if we were talking about the sort of um, hawks, eagles, that, that lineage of birds, I would put money on kites being um, sort of more caracara-like in the way that their their brains work. I mean, there's, there's some suggestion that they may even, there's one species of kite that may even use fire um, to, may, may spread uh, may spread wildfires in Australia. Um, so it, it is it, it's a it's a way of of being that that may in fact even be ancestral. It may be that some of the um, some of the earliest birds were kind of opportunistic generalists, and that you get more uh, specialized as we go on through time from the from the Cretaceous extinction. And I, Jonathan, uh, Scott, I one thing point. that we, we go ahead. I was just going to say I loved your point that you made earlier about how you know, falcons like peregrine falcons, which we tend to think of as like at the pinnacle of avian evolution, may actually just be, you know, kind of the, the dumbed down descendants of these much more, um, you know, these, 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 these much more generalist and therefore um, more adaptable and more mentally wide ranging, um, you know, basal, basal ancestors, that, you know, were, were basal to both falcons and, and parrots. You know that they've they've become really really good at this one thing. Yeah, they're, not they're particularly good at anything else. So. They're refined. You know, they're very 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 high performance sort of yeah. characters. It's kind of like it's not but, fun hanging around with somebody who really only has one interest in life. You want to hang around with somebody who's got a wide range of interests and can talk about a lot of different things. You can you can admire them. I mean, they're like Olympic athletes. I mean, they're just incredible how how good they are at that particular thing. But there's the there's the trade off that you make in becoming so hypertrophied in this one way. The one thing that we didn't really touch on much, and we, you and I, when we talked earlier, uh, talked about this with memory and long-term memory. And we had, there were two parrot stories in particular, I remember that that we, we talked about trying to get to. Jessica, I don't want to, to hamstring the questions though. Oh no, keep going, it's okay. Um, the, the, one of them was a parrot that William Henry Hudson, whom I mentioned, met in the South of England. Um, that had been uh, lived at an inn, uh, and it had been procured in uh, I think Veracruz, Mexico, something like thirty years earlier. And when they first got this parrot, it spoke Spanish, 
it sang in Spanish and it, it talked in Spanish. Over time, it lost this and began to speak English. And it was mean as a snake uh, to Hudson. He could not make friends with it no matter what he did. But once um, he heard about its past, he started speaking Spanish to the bird. And the bird didn't start speaking Spanish to him. But it did, he said, have this strange reaction where it was staring at him and staring at him. And, and after that, it became, it was his buddy. Um, it wanted to be with him. To him, what this, what this suggested was that it was conscious of a past and trying to recall it somehow. Um, but then, Scott, you had a story that, that, that went further even than this. Yeah, so I have, I have friends um, who had done wildlife rehab for years, and they worked with raptors, but they got a call some years ago when this elderly couple that had a mealy parrot, which is one of the largest of the New World um, Amazonas parrots, and they were quite elderly. They had inherited this parrot from friends of theirs who in turn had become quite elderly, had to move into a retirement home, and the bird had, if I remember the story correctly, Charlie had been taken out of the wild in the, like the 1960s by this original couple's son who was working in the oil industry. So Charlie was like 50 plus years old at this point. And so Jan and Ernie took him and not a particularly nice bird. Um, and he was starting to have health problems and his, his vision de degraded and he, 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 was, he was on the downslope. And he began making odd noises that he'd never, like he started wolf whistling, which he'd never done before. Um, and Jan mentioned something to me and we went down, we went down to visit and realized what he was doing was not wolf whistling. He was giving the scream, uh, the call of a screaming piha, which is one of the, one of the signature bird sounds of the Amazon and Orinoco rainforest. It's just um, and he was giving the three-noted song of an undulated tinamou, which you hear everywhere in the flooded forests of the Amazon. And I, the only explanation I had for it was that he was in dementia, some degree of dementia, and was reverting to his childhood. So this is a bird that had spent a couple of months in the rainforest as a chick, probably before being taken, because usually these birds are taken out of the nest. And you know, half a century later, that was that was coming back to him. So there's there's just there's a lot going on inside those little heads. A question for you both about what's going inside those heads and linking in migration um, about artificial light. Uh, we have upcoming on May 14th World Migratory Bird Day, and the theme for this year is dim the lights for birds at night. Have you seen any research on how birds have adapted to artificial light? It seems like if we can reduce that artificial light, it could help the birds as they migrate and navigate through all the threats that humans present. But do we know if their brains are adapting? I have not seen anything to that extent. Have you, Jonathan? I mean, what I've... I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is an anecdote about a peregrine falcon hunting in the columns of light from the Twin Towers monument. Um, when you have all those birds flying through it, and they're just taking advantage of this, like, well, here they are. Um, but as far as like long-term longitudinal, I mean, there's the, um, the radar studies that are so sobering um, that suggest that the number of migratory birds in the U.S. has been halved since the 70s or something like that. Yeah. So what, what, I, what I do know there's plenty of evidence for, and Jessica, I'm sure you're aware of this as well, is that we know that urban light pollution acts almost like you know moths to a flame that particularly young birds on their first migration in the fall i mean these birds evolve to navigate by starlight and so they get drawn into urban areas and and get pulled in which is why it's so important you know that we reduce light pollution as much as possible especially during those peak migration seasons in the spring and fall fortunately we know from radar studies recent radar studies that the majority of bird migration in any given urban area like New York City is going to happen in just three or four or five days in the spring and three or four or five days in the fall. So we don't have to have people turn out their lights all the time. And I have to say, I've become increasingly convinced since we know these birds are going to get pulled into urban areas anyway, that bird conservationists need to be focusing as much, in, at least as much um, attention on creating and, re and enhancing bird habitat in urban parks and green spaces um, as we do in more pristine areas, because that's where a lot of these birds are going to end up. Places like, like Central Park and Prospect Park and elsewhere. And, 
And there's really no reason why we can't, um, we can't share the landscape and create good habitat for migratory birds as well as um, space for human recreation. But as far as them like adapting to it and not being affected by it, I, I'm unaware of any research that shows that's happening. Thanks. Um, staying on the topic of threatened birds, um, but moving away from US urban areas, um, are caracaras in any sort of danger? Um, are they threatened at all? And is there a range? Uh, the, the striated species that I mentioned is, is threatened by a very, very tiny area that it lives in um, that's vulnerable to climate change because rising seas make islands smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and their population is really small as it probably has always been. Um, the, in the Amazon, um, species like the red-throated caracara seem to thrive in and only in primary forests. Um, so that species, I think, is as, as goes the forest, so goes that species. Uh, some of the other ones, I, I have a little, I'm a little more optimistic about their future, sort of no matter what we do to the world. Um, Chimango caracaras are the only species that's actually been introduced deliberately to another place, and that's to Easter Island, believe it or not, where they're now one of four land bird species. <laughs> and, um, they've, they've done just fine there. Uh, they were introduced to, to in the 20s uh, in the hopes that they would combat um, an infestation of, of mice, um, but they weren't interested in that. Um, <laughs> they, uh, uh, they're, they're known as manutoke toke, which is uh, uh, Rapa Nui for um, a thief bird. But uh, but caracaras in general, I I feel uh, you know if if any group of of birds like this is going to survive, then um, I, I feel pretty good about them. They're fascinating birds, Jonathan. Uh, how did you first get interested in caracara caracaras, and how did you start writing? I had this uh, I had a strange traveling fellowship called the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship back in 1997 when I graduated from college as an English major. And my project was to go to remote places around the world for a year and, and live with the human communities there, which I did. But um, that was one of the places I went was the Falklands. And that was where I first encountered striated caracaras just by chance. And they walked up to me and said, well, and, you know, I like to think that um, they were, they decided that, you know, I, this was the guy who was going to tell their story. <laughs> so it, they, they hooked me and, and kept me. What were some of your favorite moments in writing about them? Oh, gosh. And there's a whole section of the book that takes place in Guyana um, uh, on a, a river called the Rewa, uh, which goes sort of deep into the Guyana Shield, which has a, it's a really, it's one of the wildest parts of all South America. It's hundreds of thousands of square miles of, of primary forest. And um, I went up this river for a few weeks with uh, the researcher Sean McCann, who studies red throated caracaras and four extraordinary people from that region, uh, Brian Duncan, Josie George, Rambo Roberts, um, and um, no, it's the three of them and Sean. Um, and Guyana is really interesting because it was, a, for many reasons, but it was a British colony at one point. So it's one of the only places you can meet Amerindian people in South America who speak English. And so Brian and uh, Josie were our Wapishana people, which were, who were basically Arawak like the Arawak people that Columbus met in Hispaniola. Uh, and they're just wonderful, uh, really fun, smart, intelligent, funny people to travel with. So that experience was probably my, you know, my favorite part of working on the book. Scott, I wanna to go to a moment in your book. Um, you write about uh, the very long haul shorebird migration and the stopover sites along the Yellow Sea. Any updates on those sites? Yeah, so um, when I, you know, the Yellow Sea, for those who, who aren't familiar with it, between China and the, and the Korean Peninsula is one of the most, maybe the single most important migratory stopover point in the world for migratory shorebirds, and one of the most endangered because China in particular has destroyed about 60 or 70 percent of the mud flats on which these birds uh, depend during their migration. And when I went over there in 2018, I really thought that it was going to be the most depressing part of my book because it was just this juggernaut of coastal destruction. And then, you know, the Chinese government does did what what totalitarian governments can do sometimes, which is like one guy made a decision and said no more coastal destruction. Um, President Xi put an end to that, um, which was huge. Um, I mean, it really came at the 11th hour, and the the Chinese. Since then, 
have placed about two dozen of the most important shorebird sites on the Chinese side of the Yellow Sea um, in World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage Protection. Um, South Korea just nominated, I think, four or five of the most important sites on the South Korean side um, for UNESCO protection last year. Um, the, the South Koreans have been a little bit more behind the curve on this. That's not to say that you know we're out of the woods on this by any means. I mean, it really, in the words of Tunis Piersma, the the scientist I, I quoted earlier, you know, he said we're kind of in a birds per hectare equation where for every additional acre of tidal flat that disappears, birds die because there's simply no other place for them to go. They've been squeezed into as small an area as they have. So, but at, at least the really rampant destruction that was being driven kind of at the local level for, um, you know, converting mud flats into um, shrimp farms and industrial sites and, and new cities that that has slowed dramatically. And in fact, some of the places that they built seawalls but hadn't yet filled in, they've broken down the seawalls and let the tide back in. So they actually got a little bit of tidal flat back again. Well, that's a nice positive note to end on. Um, I want to thank you, Jonathan and Scott, for joining us this evening. We're so lucky to be able to share um, and hear those stories. Thank you for sharing the, that expertise and those insights with us. Been As I mentioned thanks. earlier, this was the last in New York City Audubon's winter lecture series. Um, and although we're drawing our lectures to a close, in just a few weeks, we're hosting another free webinar, Introduction to Birding. For those of you who may be new to birding, or if you want to brush up on your skills prior to spring migration, uh, please sign up for our webinar. Uh, my colleague Danielle is posting in the chat right now a link for, uh, to sign up. And then when you're ready to get off your computer and get outside, you can also visit the New York City Audubon website for a complete listing of public programs. We have a full calendar of spring migration walks in parks all around the city. You'll get to visit some of those urban parks that Scott mentioned earlier that are real migrant traps and exciting places to be in the spring. Thank you again so much to everyone for joining us tonight. And another big thank you to Jonathan and Scott. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.